We're recording. Okay. Angela, you go right ahead. Perfect. Okay, well, it's my very special honor to introduce our wonderful guest today, Dr. Emma Teeling. This introduction is particularly special to me as my research also relates to bats and their intriguing biological mysteries. Um, Dr. Teeling was born in, in Klontarf, I hope I'm saying that properly, uh, in right. Dublin. Uh, she did her undergraduate studies in zoology at the University College Dublin and then went to pursue uh, an MSc in animal behavior and welfare at the University of Edinburgh, where she also worked with Swiss foxes at the Cochrane Ecological Institute here in Canada, Alberta. Uh, it was during her PhD when she fell in love with these fascinating flying mammals uh, receiving a PhD in molecular phylogenetics at Queen University. Uh, and her thesis was titled A Molecular Perspective on Chiropteran Systematics. Uh, she then proceeded to do postdoctoral research at the Laboratory of Genomic Diversity at the National Cancer Institute and is now a full professor at University College Dublin, where she has founded two scientific centers, the Laboratory of Molecular Evolution and Mammalian Phylogenetics, also known as the Bat Lab, best name ever, and the Center for Irish Bat Research. Uh, if you haven't already had the pleasure of seeing it, uh, Dr. Teeling also has an amazing TEDx talk named The Secret of the Bat Genome that has over half a million views on, you can see it on YouTube and there are obviously the TED website. Uh, she's also a co-founder of the Bat1K project, which is a project that set out to map genomes of all bat species. Uh, there was also a report in Nature Magazine in 2020 of the Bat1K project where they're looking at six, six different bat genomes. And currently, her lab carries out integrative research in fields of phylogenetics, uh, zoology, genomics, and conservation biology, looking to uncover different uh, genetic signatures of survival that enable different species to adapt to their constantly changing environments. And some of the current projects include uh, the evolution of sensory perception in mammals and the implications for visual and auditory diseases, um, the mammalian tree of life, and of course, what Dr. Thielen is going to discuss today, uh, the evolution of extended longevity and tolerance in uh, immunity in bats. I want to thank you again for being here and presenting us with your wonderful work, and I think I'm not the only one excited to hear all about your new recent discoveries. Thank you. Thank you so very much. That was very thorough research. I was like, oh yes, I did do that. Um, so let me see, can we do the defying feat of sharing screens from a, a potentially very dodgy internet? Okay, hold on. Okay. Can everybody see? Right, anything, anything dramatic goes on, just somebody stopped me halfway through. I remember I was only halfway through a lecture when eventually some of the final year students went to Professor Tealy, we didn't hear anything. I was like, you should have said that about 30 minutes ago. But anyway, um, thank you so much for inviting me to come here. And I wish I could be there in person, but this is as good as we can get right now. What I want to do today is I want to talk to you about the most fascinating of all mammals, and these are our bats. And I want to give you a little bit of insight, as Andrew said, into the research I've been doing for the past 20 years, essentially, trying to uncover the genomic basis of their rare adaptations. And this beautiful fella that you see here, anybody want to guess what that is? I know we can't say it loud. It's coming close to Halloween, and that is a picture of a real live vampire bat taken by Brock Fenton. You can see it's fantastic little teeth. But again, why should we study bats? If you think about of all of the wonderful diversity that we have on this planet and all of our life forms, why would anybody spend their entire life studying these nocturnal flying mammals? What I want to do today is I want to tell you a little bit about the unique biology bats have and convince all of you that we should all be studying them. But this is a picture taken by one of my very first PhD students. And just to show you some of the diversity you can see of bats. So one in five of every living mammal today on this planet is actually a bat. So they're extremely diverse. They're found throughout the entire globe. But what I want people to think about, I want to see bats in slightly different light. And I want to tell you today a little bit about how studying bats can allow us to address two major challenges that society faces. And the first is healthy aging. Everybody around the whole entire globe is living way longer. I know that SARS-CoV-2 has caused a slight problem, slight blip in this, but pretty much globally, all our populations are increasing in age. However, despite our increased longevity, our health spans have not increased. So if we don't want to find our future societies full of the incapacitated elderly, we need to find a way to live healthier longer. 
And I want to convince you today that studying bats can give us those answers. And this is a picture taken from last year in Brazil about this huge death toll that an infectious disease can render on the human population. But I want to talk to you also about how studying bats can allow us address how we can better combat infectious diseases and how both of these two grand challenges are related. But back on to about some of the biology of these fantastic animals. So bats are the only true flying mammal. And this is important because flight is, um, it, it's a difficult locomotory trait to evolve. Think of the amount of time that flight has actually evolved on this planet. And flight is very, very metabolically costly. Indeed, a flying bat can expend 130 fold more energy and have more oxygen consumption than a, a similar mammal of the same size not flying. So flight is very, very metabolically costly. And they're the only true flying mammal. Other things just really fall with style, such as our gliders. They also are one of the only mammals to use sophisticated laryngeal echolocation. I'm not sure if you've seen a paper that recently came out in Science talking about this little furry tree mouse that is also using laryngeal echolocation. But I'm going to now use the word sophisticated laryngeal echolocation. Now, what this means, this means that they're able to orient in complete darkness in their environments and be able to navigate through really cluttered space and find insects on the wing in complete darkness. And when you look at a bat, you can look at this unique sensory ecology and you can see even just looking at the face of bats, their phenotype is for sound, very, very large ears, strange nose leaves in some species that let them direct their call, small eyes. The majority of bats do this, but there is one family of bats, these old world pteropodids that do not do this. And rather, and my, um, I suppose, where my, my, my um, beliefs are lying at the moment is that these pteropodids once had the ability to echolocate, the ancestor bat could echolocate, but this is particular family of bats lost the ability to echolocate, but instead they co-evolved or um, together with some of the spilostomids, these large eyes and this um, keen sense of smell. So they too fly, but they're also nocturnal, but they feed on fruit. So again, studying bats allows us to uncover these sensory trade-offs that can happen between evolving from big insect givers to fruit givers. So we can look at the evolution of sensory perception right at the forefront of evolution by studying bats. They're crucial for our ecosystem services. Bats are keystone predators and they moderate our arthropods. They also are major pollinators of tropical plants and seed dispersers. So bats are required for our ecosystems to function. They're as important as bees. But again, bats have gotten a lot of bad press lately due to their relationship with these SARS-like viruses. And bats have been shown to be able to host many different viruses, SARS, MERS, Marburg, potentially Ebola, without getting sick. And the question is, what about COVID-19? Can they get it? Where did it come from? What's happening with bats? But bats have been shown to have a very unique and potentially tolerant immunity that allows them to live with these viruses rather than die from them. But also some of the work I was doing when I started studying bats is that you realize that despite their really small size, bats live for an awfully long time. And I'm gonna tell you about a long-term study I've been working on to try and cover what are the mechanisms that bats have evolved that allow them to slow down the aging process. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. But really, how do you work with these non-model organisms? As a zoologist, what steps do you have to take to try and uncover genomic bases of adaptation in non-model species? And I was particularly interested in using bats as an alternative model system to allow us to uncover these molecular pathways that underlie extraordinary aging and disease tolerance in mammals. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how you do this. I'm gonna give you some of our results. I'm gonna tell you where I see the future. And this is my bunch of our PhD students, this wonderful little bat that we work on, and these are these funding agencies that funded this research. But to be able to do this, first and foremost, if you really want to uncover the molecular adaptations that non-model organisms have, have evolved, you have to have exquisite genomes. You can't have these little bitty genomes that are inappropriately annotated. I spent 20 years working with this and I got tired of it. 
So to try and uncover these unique adaptations, I realized we need really good genomes. And so this led me to found Bat1K along with Sonia Vernies. And again, this picture here is of Prasia nictris tonglongii, the smallest mammal in the world. Those fingers are my first PhD student's fingers, the size of a little bumblebee. But what Bat1K is, this is a global consortium of people where we are united to sequence the genome of every single living species of bats to chromosome level error-free assembly. And that's the important part. So that we can uncover the genomic basis of the unique traits, their extraordinary annotations. And also we wanna drive a global conservation awareness of the importance of bats. So who we are is myself and Sonia Vernes. Sonia Vernes is in, uh, she's in the Max Planck down in St. Andrews. She's really interested in vocal learning. Uh, there's David Ray in Texas Tech, interested in looking at the non-coding regions of the genome. There's Jean Myers, director of the Max Planck, who's involved really in developing the methodology for shotgun sequencing with Craig Ventner and the Human Genome Project. Michael Hiller, brilliant at looking at annotation of all different mammals. And uh, Lillian Davalos, again, she's a bat field biologist and probably an ecology statistician extraordinaire. So we all came together. We were able to uh, bring the community together and say, right, how are we gonna do this and how are we gonna move forward? And what we did was we came up with, in our pilot study, how do you move? How do you sample the bats? How do you ship this DNA around? How do you sequence the DNA? How do you assemble the DNA? How do you annotate the DNA? How do you analyze it? How do you make reference genomes from bats right across all the tree of bats? And we did this, we published this in Nature, uh, front cover was the 23rd of July, 2020. You know, I have to say, I think maybe the pandemic was good for something because people were very, very interested in this. And really this was our first example of how you can actually do this. And then we're moving forward and we sequenced representative every bat family and we're keeping going. But so the first step along trying to uncover unique adaptation bats have evolved is we have these decent genomes. And the question is, well, with these ge decent genomes, how can we address and look at this first grand challenge? How society can age more healthily? Let's remind ourselves. So there's this expected increase in lifespan. It's been predicted by the World Health Organization that by 2050, which is soon enough, there's gonna be a 340% increase in people over the age of 80 and a doubling in people over the age of 60. And while that sounds great, unfortunately, our probability of acquiring disease of the old age by the time we're 60 has stayed the same. So we gotta find a way to increase our health span to match our new lifespan. Now, We've learned lots and lots of things for studying aging in our model organisms, in our flies and in our mice. And we learned that the aging process is very conserved right across life. But I'm gonna argue we've been looking in the wrong place. We've been studying aging in candidates that are very good at dying. That's why we picked them to be in our lab. So wouldn't it be much better to actually study aging in species that have naturally evolved longer health spans. And these are our bats. And this is what really stimulates this research was this cool paper that I read by Steve Ousted. If you're interested in this, Steve Ousted does an amazing idea. And whereby, if you think about it, in nature, there's really a law. Small things live fast and die young. Think of mice, think of shrews. Big things live slow and live long. Think of whales living over 200 years. But bats are some of the smallest of all mammals, yet they can live extraordinarily long times. This is the longevity ratio, which is essentially the predicted longevity given body mass to actual longevity. And typically there's a correlation of one. But there are over 19 species of mammals that we've looked at that live longer um, than humans, given their body size. 18 of these are bats and one is a naked mole rat. And indeed this number is increasing. So bats seem to evolve mechanisms to allow them slow down aging. Indeed, this species is Myotis brantii. So this bat holds the longevity record. This bat was caught as an adult in Siberia. And a tag was put on it because the only way you can identify bats is by tagging them. It was released and it was caught again 41 years later with no signs of aging that we could see. And what was extraordinary is not the 41, but the fact that this individual, this species weighs less than a third of a lab mice. And believe me, I'm trying to find lab mice that are over two years of age and it's nearly impossible. So 
Science predicts how long humans can live for, given potentially metabolic rate and other factors, but bats have bucked this trend. And I was really interested in covering, well, how do bats defy the aging process? What mechanisms have they evolved to allow them to slow down aging? And how can you actually do this? I'm going to try and play this movie here. So I was very really intrigued by this. I thought, well, how are we going to try and study aging in bats? Typically in aging studies, you study an individual from the day they're born till the, uh, till the day they die in a lab. You can sample them at different times. But really you cannot keep captive bats, these long lived captive bats, they don't live so well in captivity. So we had to try and find a population of long lived bat species that we knew their age, that we could catch every single year, that we could non lethally sample. And for me, I was lucky enough that um, my former postdoc, uh, Sebastian Pouchma, knew this fantastic conservation organization in France called Britannia Vivant. And they had caught and tagged and had been studying these long lived species of myotis, myotis bats in Brittany in France. And they have been working with this really for the past 10 years now, whereby we go out, we go to these five roosts where the females come back every year to have their babies. We catch all of the bats as they fly out, as we saw in the start of this video. We weigh them, we tag them, we put microchips on them. So we know that if we caught a baby in 2010 and re caught it again, we know that that individual is, so if we caught it again in 2021, they're 11. And we take less than 140 microliters of blood. We take wing punches. We take different non-invasive, uh, non-lethal swabs. And we study the same individual year after year as they age. And we've been doing this now for the past 10 years. And what we wanted to look at was, okay, well, now we can be able to recatch the same individual every single year because the females come back to have their babies. We want to develop the assays to look at biomarkers of aging. And to address the question, what happens in bats as they age? Can we get some indication of what are the unique adaptations they may have evolved by looking at how do they age? So we designed assays to look at their telomeres, the protective caps on their end of their chromosomes that shorten every time the cell replicates. We want to look at their mitochondria. Do bats experience the expected level of oxidative stress given damage in their mitochondria as they age or not? We want to sequence their overall blood transcriptome. Do bats experience the same level of dysregulation as they age as we do or not? Want to look at their microbiome. What happens in bats as they age? Look at their ability to remove cellular damage. As we age, our ability to remove cellular damage decreases. We also want to look at their innate immunity. As we age, we become more inflamed. Was there something unique going on in bats? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you a bit about the telomere. I'm going to go in depth about our telomere part of the story, and then I'm going to give you the overall answers from the other part. But the first thing we're interested in, well, how do telomeres contribute to aging? And again, remember that the TTA, GGG repeats at the end of our chromosomes. And every time the cell replicates, you're not able to add on the five prime end as it gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And eventually, when you're telomeres are so short, it signals to the cell that this cell needs to be removed. It's now a senescent cell. And really the idea is that if that senescent cell isn't removed, it causes aging. And so what we wanted to see, well, all right, in the long lived bats, do their telomeres shorten or not? We were able to modify, so by the brilliant Nicole Foley and PhD student in my lab, we were able to modify this Cawthorn method. Now what this means that we did a, it was a qPCR assay where we compared telomeres to a single copy gene. What would happen was when you ran your qPCR assay, if you found a signal at the start of your cycle, you'd a long telomere, comparing with the same copy gene. Later in the cycle, it was a short telomere. And we were able to be able to use teeny tiny amounts of DNA to do this. We divided the assays to do this. So what this meant is that we were able to assess how does telomere length change in bats as they age with a non-lethal wing biopsy punch. Now what that meant was that when we would go to these meetings, a bunch of other ecologists with these long-term marker capture projects says, hey, we're really interested. So we were able to expand the different species that we were looking at because of the fact that we were, individuals had caught babies, had put a tag on them, had to release them, and therefore we were able to age the bats. There's no other way to age a bat, exactly, apart from doing this, because after one year, once their finger bones are fused, that bat's an adult. 
could be 40, could be one, you don't know. So we're able to expand this, we include Myotis Myotis, these are our French bats, Myotis Becksteini, working with uh, collaborators in Germany, Rhinolobus Vermaquino, and this is a fantastic long-standing study with Garrett Jones and Roger Ransom in the UK. And Roger has been studying these bats for 60 years. So it's a wonderful, wonderful um, marker capture project. We also were able to work with Hugo Rebello and Luis Rodriguez in Portugal, looking at mini, mini optus Fabricii. So to be able to do this, you really need to have long-term marker capture field studies because you can't look at aging in bats in any other way. And these new molecular methods. So what did we find? What we found was quite extraordinary and I didn't believe it for a very long time. But telomeres do not shorten with age in the longest lived bat genera. Here are myotis myotis. There are myotis becksteinii. There was no correlation in telomere dynamics with age, but you saw this with Rhinolobus permaquinum and Minioptus shrebrisii. That was very extraordinary. We were interested, well, what's going on? We had looked at our blood transcriptomes. We had looked at some of our fibroblast transcriptomes that we'd sequenced, and we found no evidence for telomerase expression happening in these bats. So they were maintaining their telomeres some way. And again, remember in all of us, most of their species, maybe not in birds, telomeres shorten with age. So we decided to look to the genomes that were available. And again, this is one of the reasons that drove the whole BAT1K project because we realized these genomes were no good. So we were able to identify 225 telomere maintenance genes. We lined them all up. We looked at 52 different mammals and we looked for evidence of selection. Could we find any evidence of selection that was happening in these genes that maybe underlie how the bats are maintaining their telomeres? And really we found no positive selection at all. You know, six years later, no results. The hell with Bonfroni corrections, they wreck everything. But we did find evidence of divergent selection, these two genes, ATM and FETX, along the myotis branch. When we then also looked at this comparative transcriptomic to many tissues, we found that these 21 genes were differentially expressed express these myotis bats compared with other mammals. And they seem to be enriched for DNA repair mechanisms, but also this alternative telomere lengthening pathways. So keep this in your mind. To summarize, there was no relationship between telomere length and age in the longest lived bat genera. It wasn't due to the expression of telomerase. We couldn't find it anywhere. When we went and looked at genomic and transcriptomic analysis, it implied that this enhanced DNA repair was under selection or diversion selection in bats, and maybe could explain it. But also it's pointed to the idea that bats potentially are using this alternative telomere lengthening without getting cancer. So of all order, they showed the lowest recorded rate of any form of tumor genesis. So something unusual is going on. So we're working on trying to validate this. But then let's think about flight is highly energetically costly. We want to see, well, all right, if we were to sequence the entire population of mitochondria in young, middle-aged and older bats, would we find that bats exhibit the same level of mitochondrial degeneration and oxidative stress damage as would be expected given their high metabolic rate? We did this. When we did this, we found actually no. As they age, you do not see this increased level of oxidative damage and higher level of heteroplasia in their mitochondria. And this indicates that potentially bats are able to remove mitochondrial damage or somehow have modified a way to stop it happening. So they potentially can repair or remove their damage. We looked at the microbiome and we sequenced the entire, using metagenomics, between young, middle-aged and older bats, did we find any evidence that their microbiome was changing with age as similar to ours? And we didn't they were able to maintain this homeostasis. You didn't see some change. What you did see was some really, really highly pathogenic bacteria that bats can live with that would kill other mammals. But we didn't really explore that much, but there was no aging change that we could see. We also looked at their overall blood transcriptome and we wanted to see, well, okay, could we find any genes that were correlating with age, either increasing expression or decreased expression? We didn't just want to look at the age-related transcriptional changes. We also want to look at maybe what might have been regulated. It. So we looked at the myrnomes. And again, these are these little microRNAs that regulate the expression and the transcription of these genes. And what we found, I wouldn't see, could we find any evidence adaptation of extended longevity in the bats. 
So we did this extraordinary because we'd looked at our bats, again, it's our blood transcriptomes, looking at bats between the ages of zero and 10 years of age, say, what are the changes that happen? And we were able to then compare across human, mice, and wolf. It's very difficult to find blood transcriptomic data from individuals that are not sick. And so we were lucky enough that a paper had come out the year before in Age Communications that allowed us to do this comparative analysis. What we found was extraordinary. Bats increase the maintenance of their DNA as they age. And it's different when you compare across other species. Also, you see here, here's a mouse and as mice age, they become more and more inflamed. Bats of a similar body size do not. What we were able to see was that bats also show a similar expression with age of genes known to expand lifespan in model organisms. Now, I was really glad that we found this. So we were going out into the field, taking blood, sequencing the blood transcriptomes, seeing how they changed young, middle-aged and older bats. And could you really uncover a signature of longevity? Well, this is P10 here. And what you see as the bats age, the expression of this gene increases. You can see here in red. If you wanna make a lab mouse live non longer, knock in a second copy of this gene. So that meant that we were able to uncover signatures of longevity using our methodology. But somebody said to me, well, you know, so what? We already know this. Well, this was the kind of cool stuff that we were able to find potential new candidates that hadn't been identified in either increasing or decreasing lifespan. And these are targets that we need to keep on looking at. And these were genes that were significantly overexpressed in bats with age compared to the other mammals, or significantly underexpressed in bats with age compared with the other mammals. Also, what we found was a whole bunch of these target microRNAs that maybe were regulating this transcriptomic profile. And again, we need to target this. But then somebody else said, ah, so what to just sitting in these long-lived bats? What about the ones, the shorter-lived bats? So there's very few shorter lived bats. The majority of bats live way longer than expected given their body size. But the bat that holds a record for living the shortest length of time is Molossus molossus. We were able to work with Dina Deckman and go out into the field in Panama and take, catch these bats, take some small amount of blood, less than 40 microliters, sequence the entire blood transcriptome. And what we found was very interesting. So we have these anti-longevity genes and pro-longevity genes, genes that you know if you modify them in model organisms, they live longer, you modify them, they live shorter. We found there was no significant difference in expression of the pro-longevity genes, but rather the longer lived bats express less of the anti-longevity genes. So this was interesting in itself. So there's a difference between long and short lived bats. Also, some of our field studies indicated autophagy, the ability to remove cellular damage was increasing with age in bats. But again, critics always say, ah, it's just in the field, it's all just correlation. How do you validate any of this? So we wanted to see, well, could we validate this in the lab? So phylogenomic analysis showed there was selection of certain genes. Our blood transcriptome showed that autophagy should be increasing with age in bats. And you can see here, these are transcripts indicative of autophagy. So what we were able to do was we took wing punches. Again, we took wing punches from known aged bats. We had Pipiturus cooley, who was a new species, or Myotis myotis, and we took punches from ears of mice. We grew fibroblasts in the lab. We had zero age groups, 10 age years of age, and Pipiturus cooley was kind of their maximum age. Same with the Myotis myotis. And again, this is trying to find a two-year-old mice, which is quite difficult. But what we found is when we induced starvation to induce autophagy-like response, we found that this LC3 to LC or LC3 2 to 1 ratio increased with age in bats. But again, didn't there was there was no increase with age in mice. So this again just validates again how do you validate some of your findings, which are typically correlative in the lab. So how do bats defy the aging process? So what have we found so far? What's our secret of extended health span? They repair their DNA as they age. They increase damage removal. Telomeres are maintained. But also what we found from looking at our transcripts was there was no increase in inflammation. And potentially this is all modulated by these microRNAs. So how, how, do, what, how is this pro-longevity, pro-longer health span phenotype? regulated, potentially through microRNAs. But this leads us on to the next part of this, this study is, right, as the bats age, they do not seem to show this increased inflammatory markers. And 
right now the whole world we're, we're just the reason why I'm not there is because we're gripped with this horrible horrible pandemic and there's over five million people dead and 300 million infections and so forth and really emerging infectious diseases are a huge problem it wasn't ever taken seriously and I think as a bat biologist you all you know what's coming what's coming down the line and so we need to find ways to be able to deal with this but why bats what is the relationship of bats and COVID-19 and I'm sure speaking with Judith and Angela you guys know about this but sometimes I think we have to remind everybody but well, the highest diversity of all known coronaviruses are found within bats. Now, there's also a high number of viruses found within bats, but also if you remember, one in five of every living mammal is a bat. Viruses co-adapt to their hosts. So naturally there's gonna be more viruses within the order if there's more species. What's particularly interesting though, is there's a unique high diversity of coronaviruses. When you look at some of the receptors that these viruses are using to get into mammalian cells, there's also a high diversity in bats. So it looks like they've spent a long time co-evolving together. And really the relation between SARS-CoV-2 and bats is that the closest ancestral relatives to SARS-CoV-2 have been found in bats. You have your RATG13, but you've got these close relatives. So there is RATG13, there's SARS-CoV-2. We can find that throughout Asia, you're finding close relatives in Japan, in Thailand, in China, found naturally in horseshoe bats. So although we have yet not found the smoking gun, there still isn't a 100% identity or even a 99.9% .9 identity of a SARS-CoV-2 genome in any living bat species. When you do your phylogenetic trees, they're all very closely related. So we either potentially have not found the intermediate or have not found the true reservoir host. So we've got to keep looking. So this doesn't happen again. But again, why bats? So why should they be able to have these viruses? You know, can they live with rabies? Can they tolerate Marburg? What's going on with Ebola? What's unique about bats, apart from being beautiful looking creatures? So I was pretty interested in trying to look at this because how did their immune system help us understand a little bit more about their longer health spans? And we were quite intrigued to say, well, okay, could we see, could we see and challenge bat immune cells? How do you get, find bat immune cells? How do you challenge them? What's going on in bats? So this is Joanna Caprice working in my lab at the time. What we were able to do is with our myos minus bats, we wanted to try and see, well, first of all, could we challenge our fibroblasts with immune agonists and look at their response? When we did this initially, we weren't able to get any really decent immune transcripts from the fibroblasts. And I would say, well, this is because you're looking at the wrong cell type. So what we were able to do was we said, right, well, we really do need macrophages. How do you get some bat macrophages from these wild long-lived species? So um, sadly enough, but also positive for us. So in our annual uh, field capture, what happened was it was a myotis myotis bat. It was a female baby. She had lost her wing, had been attacked by an owl. Uh, had lost the wing and was still being fed by her mother. So this bat was never gonna be able to fly. All bats in Europe were protected. So the bat had to be euthanized by our vets who work with us. What we were able to do is we were able to isolate the long bones, bring them back to Luke O'Neill's lab as a collaborator of mine in Trinity College Dublin. And we were able to wash out the bone marrow, stimulate the stem cells and turn them into macrophages. And then we were able to say, right, all right, what's going on in these long lived wild myosin myos bats? And we challenged them with poly-IC and LPS, and we looked at this simulated infection. And what we found that as the infection, the simulated infection moved on, what you found that bats very quickly mounted an extremely aggressive antiviral response, but they equally were able to dampen that antiviral response with this anti-inflammatory response. And what you see is as the progression, as, it, as the, the simulated infection progresses, bats are producing more of the anti-inflammatory cytokines to inflammatory cytokines, and they're very different from mice. So this was something that was very interesting. Again, the idea was what else is going on that makes these bats unique? Let's try. The other thing that's unusual about bats uh, is that when you go look at a lot of these viral, antiviral cytokines, genes that are allowing them have mounted antiviral response, you find that they're always switched on in bats, so they're interference. Not in all bats, but in some species. 
And again, Cara Brooks has argued that potentially this means that bats are more likely to have zoonotic diseases because they're constantly causing the virus to have to change. And if you're a virus in the bat, you're gonna to have to overcome this constant antiviral um, I suppose, uh, environment that's switched on and you have to change. So potentially this makes bats perfect for zoonotic emergence. And I know you guys can probably explain this much better and have some different ideas. But I wanna know, well, could you see any signature of unique immunity or viral diversity in our genomes? Let's bring us back to where we are. Could sequencing bat genomes give us some insight into the unique mechanisms they have evolved? Well, you could. And so here are the six genomes that we sequenced. And what you'd found when you looked, and this was just looking, aligning them all up and looking at loss or gain of different gene families. What you found that there was selection was happening, happening on a series of these innate immune genes. You also found loss and gain. And you can see here, here are these genes that show there's positive selection, here are these loss genes. And again, this was in the innate immune response. What you could also see was an expansion, for example, of this is ApoBec, which is an expansion of this gene family involved in restricting viruses. So you could see an expansion of antiviral mechanisms, but this modification of their innate immune genes. And the question is, is why? What does that mean? But the other thing I was really interested in was always the question is, are bats special? Okay, you know, there's lots and lots of bats, lots of viruses. Do they really have a long evolutionary history? with viruses, but you can also see this in the genome. Because remember, viruses will leave bits and pieces of them in the genome. And what we were able to do is when we sequence, because we use these long read sequencing technologies, we were able to sequence entire viral fragments that were found in the genome. And this indicates that bats could actually survive these previous viral infections. What we showed there was a huge diversity found within the bat genomes. And again, this was looking at only because we were able to have packed biodata could we really, really see this. And so what you'll even see is that this, there's a huge diversity of different viral types found within bat genomes. So again, studying these endogenous viruses can give us some deeper insight into the pathogen that the bats have been able to live with and survive. Yeah, you gotta remember, these viruses have to go into germline cells to get passed on. And this is something else we can do with our viruses. And then just to summarize, this is, I know people are very interested in this, and just, this is a nice, lovely review by Aaron, Aaron Irving from, who was originally in Lymph Wang's lab, so it was own lab now in China. And so what you'll see is an increase of these interferons, these immune stimulated genes, increase in heat shock proteins, the ability to remove these toxins to ABC1 in bats, and also an increase in autophagy. And we also saw this, but there's a decrease, again, in these innate immune responses, the NLRP3 signaling, that missing their entire a terrifying gene family, only bats are missing this, decrease in IL-1 beta, modifications in sting. And this is why just looking, just looking at a few bats. So really if we sequence our genomes, we study the immune response in many different species of bats, I think we're gonna get a fantastic insight in how we can live with these viruses. But what about aging? And what's the relationship between immune response and aging? Well, flight is highly, highly metabolically costly. Bats produce a whole bunch of free radicals which break up their mitochondria, which really overstimulate the immune system. So bats have had to evolve mechanisms to dampen that constant sterile inflammation. Set to an adaptation of the immune system, it's a fast, effective anti-inflammation. And this leads potentially to unexpected longevity because inflammation is not happening. And also a unique tolerance of pathogens because they also respond to the bats in the same way. But it's not just the innate immune system. There's also the fact that bats evolve mechanisms to remove cellular damage, which can happen through a high metabolic rate. They have to repair the DNA, have to be able to restore to homeostasis. If the bats are doing it, maybe the birds are too. This is something that we need to look into. But I hope I've convinced you that really studying bats can allow us to have new insights in how we can age more healthily. How do mammals age more healthily? And also they can provide alternative ways to allow us to think of how we deal with infectious diseases. So vaccines are amazing, but they're not the only thing. We think, well, how do we stop that cytokine storm from happening? How do we stop individuals sick going to sepsis, for example? Maybe studying bats and looking at how their natural infections progress will give us these insights. But also, we can look at the genomic base, the flight of echolocation. We can look at these key, key species that we need for our environments. 
to actually function correctly and that studying bats can give us an insight into all of this. So I wanna say thank you all for listening to me and that none of this is possible without the fantastic group of people that I get to work with. My PhD students, all my postdocs, all my field collaborators from the whole world. And thank you for listening. And I'll end here and stop sharing my screen. I'll try to stop sharing. There we go. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, just a, the questions. So, see, we have some questions in the chat. Um, Julian is asking. Uh, so, there was increased DNA repair activity with age. How does this relate to incidents of veterinary pathology like cancer? And are there any bottlenecks um, with age? It's a very good question. So, the thing that I always found intriguing with bats was this idea that even in the long, so people have argued that with the wild, maybe you can't see cancer in bats because they're just going to die because they're wild animals. But in these long term marker capture projects where in the females are 20, 30, there's no evidence of cancer. So there's very, very little evidence of tumor genesis in bats. There are some evidence of cancer in fruit bats that are in captivity. Whether or not it's the captivity or maybe they're the, these, these are the bigger bats that eventually this is, you know, cancer may get us all in the end. But so, the DNA repair does seem to correlate with the fact that the myotis genera and the rhinolopa genera have the lowest late rate ever of recorded cancers. Did that answer the question? Uh, yes, yes, perfect, thank you. Okay. Okay, we have another question from Dr. Gravel or gravel, I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Uh, how does the longevity ratio depend on the metabolic rate across mammals? Is there a trend here or are bats outliers on the axis and need extreme high metabolism to trigger this adaptation? It, that's a really good question. And I know uh, different people have different ideas. So body size is the one thing that the question is, does body size correlate with metabolism? Not always, okay, it doesn't. Bats are complete outliers on this trend. That's, that's so the question, is it the small body size? Is it the high metabolic rate? What, what's going on? And so I know there was a lot of work done by um, JP de Magdalene and he's working with George Church in Harvard. And again, they had to take bats out of the equation to be able to get any correlation. Um, so I'm not really, there's not a direct always one-on-one -on -one correlation with high metabolic rate and body size, but these guys have a really high metabolic rate and a very small body size. Even the big ones have a high metabolic rate too. Now, the one thing that, again, if you want to look at the longevity, there was an amazing study done by, I can't remember, the, the, these, these, this, uh, Healy et al., I think it was in 2011, where they looked at about 700 different variables that correlated or should potentially drive longevity in um, bats, birds, a whole bunch of vertebrates. And the one thing, with all the proper Bayesian analysis and the millions and millions of different types of appropriate statistics, and the one thing that seemed to drive it all was flight. And flight seems to be the major predictor of longevity. Now, is that because you can escape all your predators or is that because you're able to evolve mechanisms to maintain self? I don't know which. So I think flight, that's the interesting thing there. Now people go working on birds, go a bit mad, say, well, look at this. Some of them can live for a very short length of time, but also some can live for a very long length of time. And the, again, I think with the, with the birds that have been around for a lot longer, there's a lot more of them. So you have this ecological niche specialization happening. So hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Oh, Dr. I do have one. I was wondering whether in the in those long like uh, longitudinal studies where you go back to the bats, do you, are you looking for any pathogens, and can you see whether there's chronic infections that are that are present yeah. in these populations? Yeah, that 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 is a really good question. So we are limited by the amount. Of, if you want to not kill a bat, they're so small, you know, you can't be a vampire yourself. So we're limited by taking, you know. 100 microliters, maximum 140 microliters of, of whole blood and wing. But what we've been doing actually was when we deep sequence these transcriptomes, we, all, we didn't do poly A selection, we sequence all possible RNA that might be there, which means that you can also find 
viruses. And so even though it's in a teeny, teeny, tiny amount, you need to go way deeper and do all these other things. But we did study this. And what you would see is there is change that's happening within individuals. And you can see that there is, you know, they're surviving things that you wouldn't expect. Um, we need to go back now and maybe do that with, with, with a different lens on say, right, okay, now we're going to start looking at these infections, see how they change. Working with uh, Frederick Tuzelan, who was the vet that really started this whole marker capture project, he's really interested in how does this change? It's taking smears, trying to challenge the blood. How do you challenge 100 microliters of blood? You know, you 50, we're going to need 50 microliters is the minimum amount we can get to sequence the entire blood transcript down. So what are you going to do with 50 microliters of blood? How do you challenge it? So we're working on all of that. So it, it's possible, yes. These are flash frozen samples. Is that going to be good enough to look at the immune cells? Or no. So we, we may need to think of moving forward what we're going to do. Yeah, I was thinking more rather than blood, like to if you take fecal swabs or oral swabs, like yeah. in, the, in the places where they're actually shedding, if you see that they're shadowing, shedding like one year and then the same pathogen the next, yeah. whether it really changes from, from year to year. So we did that with rabies antibodies. And what you would see is that they actually survive. So you'll see there's there's a fluctuation in the change and you know the same the next the individual will be there just fine and seems to not have antibodies the next year so maybe there's a waning maybe there is this they're going through these infections um so i suppose what we did we have taken buccal swabs but we would need to try and deep sequence them we just done a bunch of metagenomics on them looking really at bacteria but we didn't focus on the viruses so we do have that potential <clears throat> I just Wonderful. put a question in the chat. Yeah, I can, I can just say, yeah. say my question. Oh, there's one before me. I can see um, Rodrigo asked a question. Yeah, go ahead, uh, whoever wants to go first. <laughs> so, yeah, you I mean, you talked about some changes in like every single aging mechanism almost. I think there may have been one exception for some of your bat species. So if you want to translate that into humans, hypothetically speaking, do we have to do all of that? So it, that's a really good question. Which one is the most important? Yeah. If we had to modify which one, and and I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the answer good answer, I don't know. And the question is, what's regulated? You know, do you need to do it all? So the way that we can get at that is that we're now, we're, we're now expanding out the study to include other species of longer lived bats. So right across the longevity quotient. So we go from, you know, ones with the highest LQ to ones with the lowest LQ. You see, right, what is, what do you have to have to live longer? So if you think about it, with the horseshoe bats, their telomeres are shortening with age. Maybe not at the same rate, but they're living for a long time. So telomere maintenance isn't crucial for living a long time. We now need to look and see, well, okay, is it DNA repair? So I think the longest lived species, like a bit like those naked mole rats, the longest lived species have all multiple mechanisms that allow them live way longer, but maybe you don't need to have all of them. And then for humans, what you might find, well, actually, probably the most important thing is this immune, immune modulation. Yeah. And how do the bats regulate it? Is it these microRNAs? And the problem with microRNAs is that they target so many different pathways. But is it one microRNA to rule them all? So this is what we're trying to get at by using this idea of studying aging in bats that have naturally evolved different. So you have a very long-lived species with a closely related shorter-lived species. What's the changes? And you can see right across the whole tree to give us a bit more insight into what's so very important. I jumped over Rodrigo. Rodrigo, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Um, hi, I don't know if you can, can you hear me? Hi Rodrigo, yes. Yeah. Okay, good, okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, Emma, for such a wonderful talk. It was really, really interesting. Um, I was just wondering a very naive question about like sun exposure, um, thinking of whether there is any correlation between mammals that live longer with respect like no nocturnal versus di diurnal mammals. And I was also wondering the, the, the time that I have heard about science done on bats, it's like maybe the last 10 years or even maybe a little bit more of that. Maybe I'm just not uh, ignorant on the history of bat research, but my point is, would it be possible that the fact that we have not so much uh, uh, altered their environment, uh, as far as I know, maybe we have been disturbing their environment a lot. Does that have something to do, do you think? 
uh, to, to change their longevity. So, so is the question you're asking that, that do you think that if we alter their environment, we're going to change how long they can live for? Um, somehow, what, what I mean is, uh, well, it's a two in one question. One part is the, the sound exposure question. Oh, yeah. And the other yeah. thing is that I have the impression that um, the environment in which the, or their habitat has been evolved naturally on its own without us so much perturbing it. And I wonder whether that uh, exposes some animals to more contact with other animals that they wouldn't have yeah. contact with otherwise, and therefore yes. exposed to some other diseases and so on. So the, the first part on the sun. So the they've done. So Steve Eisen did some interesting experiments where he tried to radiate back and see whether or not they're able to repair their DNA. So UV is real bad if you can't repair it. Um, but it looked like they're actually able to repair it. Now the, the idea of the sun is maybe what's the problem is that they overheat. So if you think of those fruit bats in Australia, so they are hanging out in the trees and they die from getting too hot. And so is it the sun that is affecting them or is it just that they're too hot? So I, I don't know what the right answer is there. And um, the interesting thing about the fact that they're nocturnal. So again, he et al would have put nocturnality into their big, huge uh, macroecology matrix. And that didn't jump out as being a major um, explanation of how long things live for. But again, maybe there's something weird going on with the nocturnality in terms of their bemoan, their clock, and which genes get switched on and off at different times. So maybe that does play a role. I don't know. Um, but the idea that, all right, are we somehow, I presume this is the question we're asking, we're, by human interaction right now, by building roads right through the Amazon, by um, bringing ourselves much more into natural habitats by going into caves and having you know parties and and full moon parties in thailand are we actually exposing ourselves to pathogens yes absolutely and the whole idea of zoonotic diseases is that you know sometimes i think as we don't we forget we're mammals we forget we're other animals and that viruses are real happy to happen to us too and so i do think that if we have this we got to be cognizant of the fact that if we encroach in nature you're going to pay the price if you don't think about it. And so I really believe that if we don't manage how we are interacting with nature, these pandemics are going to become, of course, they have to, more and more prevalent. Awesome. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions for Dr. Teeling? Well, I, I can ask a Bob's own question. Uh, if I... No, I don't know the answer. <laughs> So, so, I mean, you mentioned that bats are among the most numerous mammals, and they seem to have a very large, effective population size. Yeah. Uh, I mean, could that play a role in them having been able to adapt more to these uh, later onset diseases that selection doesn't see in other uh, smaller NE organisms? Yeah. People have argued that, yes. That could also explain, but they don't always, they don't all of them have such huge population size. Tetherida brasiliensis does. You know, it's the largest of all vertebrate colonies that we have on record. So that definitely does. But some of them do other things. So they, they don't necessarily all roost together and they have small, uh, and, and they don't really interact. Maybe it plays a role, but we're going to see a change then because unfortunately, our population numbers around the whole world are, are decreasing. And if you think what we're doing, the majority of bats are insectivorous. And now due to the use of insecticides, the food that they eat is going. So you, you can just see all the diversity dropping. So unfortunately, I'm hoping we're not going to see a spike in that. Great. Well, if there are no other questions, I want to thank you again for joining us today. That was wonderful. It was riveting. <laughs> it's amazing talk. Um, oh, there's another question. Would... Lucas, would you like to ask out loud? We have a yeah, I'm so, so, so. Oh. Hi, Lucas. <laughs> Sorry about that. OK, I, I, can, I can see you. Yeah, maybe I can you ask read for you. Then. Yeah, I can ask. Um, is there a reproductive advantage or evolutionary pressure for bats to live longer, i.e. higher fitness for long-lived bats? Or do bats live longer simply because they can? Kin selection, really, question mark? <laughs> Sorry. Brilliant question. Um, and let's think about it. This is the thing that intrigues me the most about this is how do the shortest lived bats manage to maintain a stable population size? Because remember, they're only having one baby a year. So not like a mouse, 
having 14, 15 babies, um, having more than one reproductive, the majority of them will only have one baby a year. So therefore they're gonna to have to have long enough to place mom and dad just to maintain a stable population size. They do not have their babies typically um, on, well, some of them, um, you can find one-year-olds that will have a baby, but usually it's by the time they're two. We're having one baby every single year. And um, so the advantage is that they can actually replace themselves or replace more. The thing that bats do not do and they don't show any signs of is menopause. And so what you'll find that age does not correlate with a decrease in, uh, or a, a, a supposed fitness decrease. So again, living longer allows them to have more babies. Now, the other thing that's, um, which we didn't really touch on is that there is still about, um, about a 50% mortality rate in the first year, at least in our city populations. Um, once the babies get back, you know, if they, we, we cash them when they're one, chance that they're gonna keep going. So they just need to get past that first winter. And this is in a temperate environment where what will happen is that they, if there's a, a cold spring, now cold spring's lethal for bats, because what happens is they've just come out of torpor, there's a cold, wet spring. And if they haven't put on enough fat way back in August, they're not gonna make it. And so again, typically it's the juveniles and that will not make it. And what will also happen is that the females, they're able to slow down the gestation of their babies and when it's a cold spring. And that just means that the babies are born later in the year. If they're born later in the year, chance are you gonna have none of time to get fat. And so, you know, a very happy bat, we call them, what do they call them? Like teddy bears. They're these huge, the fattest things you've ever seen and how they can fly around. They're the ones that are gonna survive hibernation. So I guess the whole idea is that you have this 50% mortality, well, close to, maybe not quite so high. Um, but once you get to one, you're all right. And so you do need to live a long time because again, they're selecting to have one baby, not lots. Chances are because they have no predators because they fly. So they're allowed to evolve the mate themselves or has evolving flight necessitated the adaptation of their innate immune system and their other pathways that has allowed them therefore evolve in this way. So I'd love to know how many babies the ancestor bat had. Well, any other questions? I think our time is just about up, but that was wonderful once again. Thank you so much, Dr. Teeling. Hopefully we can meet one day in person. <laughs> I'd like that. Come to the, the um, 19th International Bat Research Symposium is going to be in Texas in August. Worst time of the year to ever go to Texas, but forget about that. There's air conditioning in America. So if people are interested in listening to bats, come on, come on, come on there. Yes, for sure. Thank you so much. That was, thank you. Thank you. That was great. So, Judith, do I stay in the line? We, we talk now on this one, or do we do a different Zoom? Uh, I'll send you a different Zoom. Yeah. Okay. See you later, guys. See you.